Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Zor Education. Um, we continue talking about waves and in this particular case we continue talking about transversal waves. Um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens presented on Unizor.com. Um, there is a prerequisite course which is Mass for Teens on the same website and um, I do suggest you to watch the lecture as the part of the course and uh, that means you have to go to Unizor.com and follow the menu. Um, if you found this lecture on, on YouTube or, or, or somewhere else um, just by itself, I mean obviously it has its own benefits, um, but don't forget I'm using always information in previous lectures in subsequent ones. So there is certain logical sequence and, uh, and then you obviously have the benefits of um, having exercises, having exams if you are on the website. So I do suggest you to, to use the website for basically education for taking the whole course. Um, by the way, the site is completely free. There are no advertisements, no strings attached. Even your login is not um, uh, mandatory. You, you, you can do it just for purposes of exams and there is certain educational process actually which you can get involved. Um, anyway, so we'll talk about transversal um, waves. Now, the uh, title of this lecture is Musical Strings 1, and there will be probably Musical Strings 2. Um, well, it implies we are talking about strings as part of the musical instrument, like guitar or violin. Um, now, that's actually a very um, complex um, thing to, to study in full details. So. I will try to simplify this as much as possible. I will build certain simple model and then I will investigate how this simple model behaves. Um, so before the only example of transversal waves in the previous lecture was when you have a, a rope, let's say, and you're um, waving it uh, up and down and it actually propagates the waves. Um, so the waves are propagating one way, but the every little piece of uh, of the rope was actually moving perpendicularly, or almost perpendicularly. But we did talk about this almost. Um, in this case, I would like to talk about a string used in the musical instrument, like a violin, and um, I think I will try to basically exemplify the same thing, how these transversal um, uh, oscillations are, are happening and I will try to um, mathematically approach um, what exactly is happening with every piece of this, of this string. Now, again, as I was talking, it's too complex to basically research this thing in all the details. So I will try to do it step by step and in today's lecture I will exam <coughs> uh, I will exemplify the um, oscillation of a string on a very very simple model. So what is that the model we are talking about? Well a string is something which is actually uh, fixed at two ends Mm, with certain tension. You remember in violin or a guitar we have certain things we have to turn to make the tension on that string and depending on the tension um, the tone uh, of, of the sound is changing. The, the more tense um, we are making the string the higher the tone which means um, more frequently it oscillates. But let's just have it mathematical. So this is a string and if we will pluck it somewhere in the middle which means we will just make this shape out of it and let it go it will start oscillating between these two. These two are these two points are fixed obviously but it will start oscillating from this to this etc. So that's basically how um, the sound is produced. 
And as I said, it's kind of complex to research right now in full details. So let's just make a, a very, very simple model which resembles this particular type of oscillations. And we will try to uh, mathematically research how this would work. And even there, actually, we will have problems. So what exactly is the model we are talking about? Let's consider, again, two ends, but instead of a, a uniform string, I will have two weightless springs with certain mass in the middle. And the length of the whole thing is the length of the spring, uh, of the string of the musical instrument. So whatever it is, the guitar, for instance, has something like this. Like uh, almost a meter, maybe, or less, 60 centimeters. So let's imagine that we have this type of thing, this type of arrangement. So there is a mass, M, and each particular string, let's assume these are identical strings, and each of them in length is equal to half of that distance. So uh, it has certain coefficient of elasticity, K or kappa, and now we have to really think about this tension thing which we are doing in the very beginning with, a, with, with any string and a musical instrument. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means that these strings, these springs, I was <laughs> kind of mixing string and spring, so these two springs are supposed to be tense already at certain tension. What does it mean? It means it should be a little stretch. So the natural, the neutral length of each uh, spring is smaller, and we have just stretched it a little bit. And this one. So it's already at certain um, stretch. So let's assume that each um, string has its own length, and there is a certain um, uh, stretched uh, uh, additional lengths which we have stretched it into. So if this is modeling our um, string on a musical instrument which is already stretched a little bit. So again let's just think about there is something which is a length of the string or two springs in a neutral state and then there is a certain additional lengths which we have uh, stretched it to to create this tension which means that every um, each of these uh, springs has the lengths L plus L divided by 2 L plus L divided by 2 so this is my model which models an oscillation of a string um, stretched between two ends. Okay? Okay, so this is my initial model. Now let's think about what happens if we will pluck this particular um, construction similarly to plucking a, a, a string on a musical instrument. That means we just have to take this mass shift it a little bit up and let it go and it will obviously oscillate on these two springs between two fixed ends and our task right now is to mathematically approach how it happens actually what exactly is happening in this case well let's think about it as soon as you will um, move this mass point mass a little bit higher you increase the length of these strings a little bit more. So you're increasing um, the tension. But now let's think about how the forces are distributed. If you will lift this point mass a little bit up, this is one spring 
string, spring. This is another spring. Now the springs will push this way, right? Because we are stretching the spring. So this is stretched and this is stretched. Well, it was already stretched here. Now we are stretching even more. Now at new at, at position at initial position, these two stretched strings also have certain forces this way and this way. But these two forces are along the same direction and then they neutral and, and they neutralize each other. So that's why if you don't move this point mass from its initial position, nothing happens. It does not move. But as soon as you are shifting it a little bit up, then these two forces start acting and they are not opposite to each other. There is an angle here, right? So if you will take the horizontal components and vertical components. So these are horizontal. This is vertical component of each force, and this is horizontal component. So horizontal components are neutralizing each other, but the vertical components will push it down. So this is the force which pushes back to initial position. And then it goes by inertia even, f uh, even further down, and that's how it oscillates. Okay, so let's just calculate what exactly is happening in this particular case. We had the first uh, initial uh, lengths of each strength, L plus L divided by 2. Now we will introduce a variable, uh, the deviation along the vertical line. So deviation from the initial position would be uh, y, coordinate y, as a function of time. So at time t equal to 0, we have um, initially shifted our point mass, our central mass, by certain lengths and let it go. So y of zero is equal to, well, I put it A, certain initial distance we started plucking. And initial speed is equal to zero because we didn't really push anything, we just let it go. So this is our initial position. So this is our main variable, Y, which characterizes how far from the central position our point mass is at any moment time. So, now we can basically calculate what kind of forces are, are we talking about. So, we have stretched this uh, spring to a hypotenuse. We have one catetus which is equal to y of t, and another catetus is initial stretched length of this spring. So, what will be the lengths of uh, the spring after we have shifted the uh, point mass up, well, it will be obviously square root of L plus L divided by 2 square plus Y square of T. This is the length of the spring after uh, our mass is positioned at any point Y of T as a function of T. So this is the length. Now, and as we were saying, this is already stretched length. And what's the neutral length? Length of this spring in the neutral position. Well, that's L divided by 2. We have already stretched it here. But initially, the length in the neutral, not stretched, not squeezed, length of this spring uh, was L divided by 2. So the difference between these two is uh, the uh, increment of the length relatively to its neutral uh, length. Now we can apply the Hooke's law. Now the Hooke's law is telling that the force which this, this force 
along the uh, length of the uh, spring. So this force is equal to increment of the length multiplied by certain coefficient of elasticity. So this is the force which, is goes, go, which goes along this and the same thing along that. Now, as I was saying, we can actually represent this force as a sum of vertical and horizontal component. Horizontal components are cancelling each other, but the vertical component is acting exactly along the movement, and that's what we need to calculate. So what is this, 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 this piece? Well, it's the force times sine of this angle. Now, sine of this angle is uh, proportional to uh, ratio between this and this, catetus divided by hypotenuse. Obviously these two triangles are similar to each other, so if we will multiply f by sinus of this, it will be exactly the same thing as multiplying by the ratio between this and this. Now the ratio of this and this is y of t divided by the length of the whole thing, which is, by the way, this one. And this is my vertical force from one spring. Now we have two springs, and each of them has exactly the same vertical component. So I have to really multiply it by 2. And if I would like to really know what is this vertical component is, I should really have this expression, whatever this expression, but with a minus sign. Y minus sign. You see, if Y is positive, then the force goes uh, down, which means opposite to growing of the y component. Is if y component is negative, considering this is a zero, positive, negative. If y is negative, then the force must be positive, right? So everything else is positive in this case. So basically that's why we have this minus, as typical in any kind of um, Hooke's law uh, application. So we have this as the force which is acting. It's a combined force of two springs. Now, what is my differential equation? Well, that's equal to m times acceleration, the second Newton's law. Second derivative of y. And here is our differential equation, right? Okay, so let me just represent this differential equations in a slightly different format. So, um, first of all, I will divide by m. So I will have y of t. Now, if this is equal to this with a minus sign, I would put everything into the, uh, into the right side of this equation and have it equal to zero. So that would be zero equals. So y, now m I will put here as uh, a, a denominator, so that would be what? It would be 2 k divided by m, then this, okay, y of t also will be here, and then I will have this divided by this. You see, this is the same, so if I will divide this to this, there will be 1 minus, now this divided by this, so it would be L divided by 2 divided by square root of L plus L square divided by 2 plus Y square of T. So this is my differential equation. Well, let me tell you it looks ugly and uh, I don't really know how to solve this differential equation but my first purpose was well first of all 
any differential equation can be solved numerically or whatever else we want to. Um, but analytically, it's com sometimes difficult. This is difficult to, uh, to solve analytically. I mean, I don't know how. In any case, I mean, maybe if you will just, you know, spend some time and maybe there will be certain ways of solving this, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is not to go into mathematical difficulties, but just to explain actually what physically happening and have some mathematical proof that this is exactly what's happening. So, how can I approach it? Well, physicists are, in cases like this, uh, don't hesitate to simplify mathematical uh, formulas, assuming that certain variables are too small, too big, or whatever else, something else. Now, if you remember, even the Hooke's law is uh, always commented, okay, this is the nice law, but only if we are deviating from the neutral position by a little bit. So, if you will significantly deviate from the neutral position, it would be much more complex, because there are much more complex things involved in this thing. But somewhere around the neutral position, these um, oscillations do obey the Hooke's law. And that's the same thing with, with every other physical law. It's always to a certain degree of precision. So, I would do exactly the same. Now, let's think about it. What is y of t? y of t is vertical displacement of this center point, which basically models the um, uh, displacement of the uh, string from its uh, initial horizontal position uh, up and down. And this uh, displacement is usually very small. I mean, just think about it. You have a guitar. It's a relatively long string, right? And you're plucking it just a little bit. So the, um, uh, the distance by which you are deviating uh, the position of the center point of this uh, string from, the, from, the, uh, from its initial position is really small. Now, relatively to total lengths, even divided by two, y of t is always small, so this a is very small. So, what, uh, what I will do, I will just say that, you know what, relatively to the whole thing, this contributes very, very small amount to, uh, to the denominator. Let's get rid of it. Let's just assume that this is zero. Well, I know it's wrong. But it's not that wrong. I mean, approximately, it will still give me certain mathematical result which resembles the uh, real physical situation. And again, that's how physicists are doing in many, many different cases. Um, as a mathematician, I do have my reservations about this. But as uh, somebody who really wants to know how the physical process is actually um, doing, with a certain precision, I can really do it safely. And let's see what happens. Now, now I have the completely different situation. Now, if this is not here, square root, and this is a square, so it would be just uh, L plus L divided by 2, right? And uh, since this is divided by 2 and this is divided by 2, 2 can actually cancel each other. So the whole thing would be L divided by L plus L, this. Now, 1 minus L plus 1 minus would be equal to uh, common denominator L plus L minus L, so it would be L divided by L plus L. So the whole square in, in, uh, expression in square uh, brackets would be equal to this. So my equation would be y of t, this is plus, plus, 2 k over m 
L over L plus L Y of T Am I right? Now let's think about what this is. Well, if you remember the previous lectures, we always had equation of this type. This is the equation of harmonic oscillations. We had it for the first um, uh, lecture about waves, and this is basically the angular speed or angular frequency. Um, and the result of this is something in case y of 0 is equal to a and y of 0 derivative speed is equal to 0. In this case, it's something like y of t is equal to a times cosine omega t. So we did have this equation and we did have this solution with these initial conditions. If we don't remember, just go back a couple of lectures. It, it's all derived over there. And we have exactly the same situation here. So this is my omega square. So from this follows that vertical displacement of my uh, point mass in between these two spring, uh, string, springs <laughs> in between the two springs actually is making harmonic oscillations with the frequency which is determined this where k is coefficient of elasticity m the mass of that um, central point mass l is initial length of a string which we are modeling without initial stretching and tension and L is uh, basically the length by which we are um, trying to stretch this particular um, string. Now what's interesting here is that the greater the L the greater will be frequency and the greater frequency means higher uh, tone of the string, right? The more frequently it oscillates, the higher will be um, the, the, the sound the musical instrument makes. So this is basically a mathematical explanation why it happens. The more tense you uh, have made this particular string, the higher will be the tone it produces. So, again, we have harmonic oscillation of this center point. Now, granted, this model of two springs instead of a real string like we have in a musical instrument is a simplification. But it can be expanded, and I would like to say that there is a very strong similarity between oscillation of this on two springs and oscillation of a musical string. So this similarity actually brings us to an opinion at least that the uh, oscillations of the real string of a guitar or a violin really resembles at least the each point. Uh, it resembles um, the harmonic oscillation to a certain precision, obviously. In reality, it's significantly more complex. And obviously, um, it's more complex because there is also the resonator, which also produces certain secondary waves. So it's not just the, the string which produces this particular sound. It's also kind of reflected through this resonator, etc. So much more complex. Nevertheless, in the beginning of that thing, 
like in a very very uh, basic type of understanding what's happening. This is probably not a bad model and this model gives us relatively precise uh, description of oscillations which are coming uh, which, which are uh, occurring in this case and we also have a very nice explanation that the tension is very much related to the tone of the sound which musical instrument makes the more uh, lengths we have really stretched our uh, string the more frequently it uh, oscillates and the higher the sound is well that's it for today thank you very much and good luck <laughs>